So welcome everyone. Glad that you could uh, be with us. This is the third part of our uh, sessions on salivary gland uh, pathology and specifically salivary gland neoplasms. So uh, last time we covered secretory carcinoma and mucoepidermoid and some of the more common ones. We'll, we'll have a few more common lesions to cover this evening um, and hopefully uh, that will uh, wrap us up uh, with uh, that uh, um, uh, issue. Um, and then we'll be able to pick a new topic. So be thinking about what uh, you'd like us to cover uh, for the next time. Um, so as I mentioned, we're gonna start with uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is a uh, fairly frequent uh, tumor not the most frequent by any means, but common enough that uh, you'll see it. Um, of course, it can occur in a variety of sites, and uh, we see it sometimes in the breast, or we see it sometimes in the lung, but salivary glands are certainly the most uh, frequent uh, location. Um, and it's most commonly in the parotid, because we have more parotid uh, tissue than other tissues. Um, and as you know, it has a variety of different patterns, uh, sort of a tubular pattern, cribriform, more organoid, sometimes solid, and sometimes can have uh, ductal and myoepithelial differ differentiation. So uh, I've got several digital slides to sort of illustrate some of these patterns. Now, interestingly, there, most of these have some sort of a fusion gene uh, with NFIB. Uh, um, that seems to involve this. And this is characteristic of many kind of fairly monotonous uh, tumors is that there's some sort of a fusion gene. And of course, the most frequent uh, feature we see is the perineural invasion. Uh, and generally these are quite aggressive tumors. Although, as I mentioned, that patient had uh, almost 20 years of survival after a, a resection with positive margins and so forth. The immunohistochemistry is uh, interesting because we have some myoepithelial markers as well as uh, squamoid markers and myoepithelial markers and also CD117, which is quite useful, uh, but this is not due to a, a CKIT mutation. So it's not clear why, why it expresses that, but it's not because of a mutation. <clears throat> so let's take a look at some uh, representative cases and. Uh, begin to look at some of the uh, pathology that we expect with uh, these tumors. Uh, here's a, a nice example. Uh, we see some larger ducts here. Um, and then we see this sort of organoid pattern with uh, small cystic spaces, some solid areas. Um, and as you look at the nuclei, of course, they tend to be fairly uh, small and compact. Uh, and maybe you can see two cell types uh, in here to some degree, not always. Uh, so this would be sort of a tubular or organoid pattern uh, that you might uh, uh, think of. <clears throat> a little bit of solid differentiation. I didn't see in this particular case any perineural invasion right off the bat, but you can see the, the it's not encapsulated. It has a, a somewhat infiltrative uh, nested pattern of growth uh, out into the surrounding tissues. We'll go through another uh, case. Uh, here again, you see somewhat different pattern, a little bit lobular, uh, and some broad, very solid areas here. So I think looking at this, you might not think right off the bat adenoid cystic carcinoma because it's large sheets of cells uh, with a, a little bit of vascular stroma. Uh, <clears throat> but this is one of the patterns that can be seen. And this is where immunohistochemistry with CD117 may be helpful. Uh, or looking at other areas in the tumor, 
such as mm -hmm. over here, uh, where we see a little bit more uh, nested uh, pattern and a uh, bit more variability. Now this almost looks like it has a lymphoid stroma, but in fact, this is all tumor. It's all tumor cells. So you might, uh, in some circumstances, confuse this with maybe a lymphoepithelial carcinoma or something like that um, at first glance, because here you see uh, the tumor growing amidst some maybe some benign residual ducts. And if you thought these were lymphoid cells, you could think lymphoepithelial carcinoma or something like that. <clears throat> Here's another case. And here, this maybe looks a little bit more consistent. You have uh, more of the kind of trabecular pattern here. Uh, and I think in this case, we have a little bit of the uh, sort of cylindromatous uh, appearance. Uh, these sorts of small nested areas like this begin to look like uh, the small collagenous cylinders that we think of as the classic features of adenoid cystic. But as I hope you're beginning to see, uh, these can have a variety of uh, morphologies and not every case is going to have that uh, classic cylindromatous uh, pattern. So I think that's about all in this case I wanted to say. We have another example. Um, here you can see another sort of nested and lobulated, more solid type pattern. And then here is a sort of a uh, microcystic pattern over here in the in the cells with this very uh, sort of mucoid um, substance. So it looks a little bit like a, you know, maybe like a mucoepidermoid or something like that, except the cells are much smaller. And you don't have the uh, cytoplasmic uh, globules that we think of usually. Here's a little bit more of that with a more sieve-like pattern, where you see the sort of cribriform uh, nature of the mucoid uh, material uh, as well. So there's quite an interesting and broad spectrum with this uh, disorder. Here's one that's, I think, arising from a minor salivary gland. And I think maybe we'll be able to see a little perineural invasion here. So here, um, this is an interesting feature. So this is uh, benign tissue here, benign salivary tissue that has become compressed. And sometimes when that happens, it can look like a small infiltrative neoplasm, but this is actually just benign salivary gland that is uh, undergoing atrophy due to the mass effect of this uh, very quite high grade uh, component. Um, and seeing this, I might wonder if this is really adenoid cystic because this is much higher grade uh, tumor than the usual adenoid cystic carcinoma. So I, I'm hearing someone talking in the background. Maybe you should uh, mute because I, I can't understand uh, what you're saying there. 
So uh, this was called in, in the files an adenoid cystic carcinoma, but notice how much higher grade uh, tumor it is. So uh, you might also almost wonder if this had sort of uh, de-differentiated uh, in terms of the typical uh, behavior. And I'll have to take it on faith that the person who showed, showed me that case uh, made the right diagnosis. Okay, well, let's go on to another tumor that is uh, quite varied in its uh, morphology. Uh, the name says polymorphous, uh, and it used to be called polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma. Um, and that's usually it's a low-grade tumor. Uh, this is something that we see in the uh, uh, minor salivary glands, usually in the palate. Um, so on the hard palate. Um, and uh, the nuclei are really quite bland. They're very uh, small. They're sort of like papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, um, but the architecture can be quite variable. Now, interestingly, these have uh, a genetic alteration that's been identified in the PRK gene, PRKD gene, um, with several hotspot mutations uh, identified. So if you're interested in the molecular, that would be the, the thing to know. Um, they have the S100 positivity, but also they're positive with SOX10, CK7, and very often P63. But in contrast to uh, you know, adenoid cystic, they're negative with P40, they're negative with GFAP. Uh, they don't stain with any of the, the breast type markers that you might see in secretory carcinoma like uh, GATA3 or GCDFP. So a, a little different uh, immunophenotype, and that can be helpful uh, if you're wondering about these cases. So uh, here's an example, um, and we'll just begin to sort of cover some of the uh, patterns that we can see. So this is uh, kind of a nesting and uh, partly cribriform pattern. a lot of mucoid background. As we come into higher magnification though, I think you'll see, you know, these really are quite low grade looking nuclei. Um, they have a few central nucleoli, uh, maybe a few grooves and so forth in some of these cells. And you might occasionally find indentations or uh, vesicles kind of like papillary carcinoma. Um, not quite the same. Those are usually maybe a little bit more atypical than this would be. So a low grade appearance, nesting, glandular, solid areas, um, that is something to be thinking about. Let's see if this uh, perivascular invasion here. Well, there may, this may be a little bit of perineural growth here. So perineural invasion, not specific, certainly for adenoid cystic carcinoma. Here's another example, um, more solid appearing areas. Uh, some budding. And here you can see a little bit more of the nuclear clearing that looks a little bit more like papillary carcinoma uh, in these nuclei. Um, a little bit of uh, sort of ductal differentiation, almost a two cell type pattern in some areas. And a little bit of uh, mucoid matrix I think the first few times I saw one of these, I had a real hard time figuring out what it was. It didn't look like a lot of other things. Um, here's another a very solid tumor, um, nested lobulated pattern. So again, the purpose here is to just give you an idea of the spectrum 
of patterns that can be seen in these entities. Uh, notice here at the periphery of this that we also get kind of these small glandular structures and infiltrative small nested pattern, almost uh, sort of a sieve like or lace like pattern. Uh, that also is uh, commonly seen in this, uh, this tumor. And then I think I have another one here. Again, notice we're here uh, in the hard palate, squamous mucosa. And uh, here's some minor salivary gland tissue here. And then we have this tumor with, uh, you know, infiltrative pattern of small glands and small nests, a little bit of uh, more, uh, you know, lace-like or cribriform pattern, mucoid background. I think if there's probably any pattern that's kind of typical, it's more like this than those solid ones that I've shown you. Um, but it is called polymorphous because it's quite variable. We'll take a look at the nuclei here again, just so you get the sense for those. Again, notice how small, round, occasional small nucleoli, scant cytoplasm very small nests of uh, tumor cells. And if you're not sick of them yet, we'll show you one more here. Uh, this one has this interesting sort of uh, papillary pattern to it, <clears throat> sort of uh, branching uh, glands and cords with these papillae um, in this pattern a little bit of hyalinization of the stroma in between. So again, quite different in terms of the pattern, um, but all part of the spectrum of this uh, low-grade uh, polymorphous uh, carcinoma. So remember they're S100 and SOX10 positive. Of course, they're not melanocytic, um, but uh, would be uh, P40 negative um, as well. And one more case. Oh, I may have duplicated this one, so I'll, we'll go with it in the next slide. Again, uh, this one a little bit more encapsulated, um, showing some solid areas some more cystic uh, dilated spaces, small nests uh, in this pattern. And this here you see this slight sense of an encapsulation uh, in this tumor. So you might wonder in an encapsulated tumor, well, are we dealing with a pleomorphic adenoma or something of this sort? Because this is very low grade um, type of lesion, but pleomorphic adenomas should not be positive with um, you know, SOX10, um, and uh, so that can be a helpful uh, feature in that regard. And of course, pleomorphic adenoma in the hard palate would be extremely unusual. So this is a little unusual in that it's encapsulated. Uh, but you can see that it's certainly going through and beyond the capsule in several areas here uh, and there. Okay, well, let's uh, step on to a, a different topic. <clears throat> this is a much less frequently encountered tumor um, and uh, tends to have a particular ethnic distribution, lymphoepithelial carcinoma, uh, in contrast to what we've just talked about is a very high grade or undifferentiated carcinoma that's set a, amid a very dense lymphoid stroma. Um, interestingly, lymphoepithelial carcinoma of the salivary glands 
can also be associated with uh, development of lymphoepithelial carcinoma in other organs, the uterus, uh, stomach, and so forth. Uh, but surprisingly, despite the very high grade uh, anaplastic undifferentiated appearance of the carcinoma component, it has a very favorable outcome with uh, maybe as much as 95% of people having long-term survival. Um, this is probably because it's uh, got this uh, uh, association with Epstein-Barr virus. Um, and in most cases, if you do the in situ hybridization for the Epstein-Barr early reactive antigens, uh, it will be positive. Um, but that's not totally specific um, because obviously other things can have uh, EBV uh, and not every case is positive. Um, in terms of differential, you know, other lymphoid lesions can look a little bit like this, have a lymphoid stroma, Warthin's tumor, uh, reactive lymphoepithelial lesions, Sjogren's syndrome, obviously lymphoma and so forth uh, can have some features uh, akin to this, but all of those will not have this very high grade undifferentiated carcinoma component. Now, uh, they most commonly occur in the parotid um, and they can have this very sort of lymphoma-like uh, appearance, sort of what we call fish flesh, uh, very friable but solid glistening tissue uh, that is uh, what it looks like grossly. Uh, these pictures are thanks to my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, <clears throat> uh, Lester Thompson uh, from, uh, his uh, publication on this topic. So I don't have a lot of examples of this uh, lesion, uh, but here's uh, an example. And this looks very blue and it looks very um, nested and nodular. However, as we come into uh, areas of this, I think you'll see that uh, the blue here uh, are uh, lymphocytes all of these blue cells around. But then we have these, these cells admixed, which look a little bit like germinal centers, uh, but they're not rounded in quite the same way. Um, here you see a rounded one, but here you see these areas of um, sort of infiltrative uh, tumor with a very, a very high grade appearance. And you, you can see why lymphoma would be in the differential diagnosis for this, because you could say, well, is this a large B cell lymphoma or something like that with a, an accompanying uh, smaller uh, cell component? Um, we'll look at a few other areas here in this case. Here again, I think you'd begin to see with this sort of a pattern that this is more of an infiltrative carcinoma type of, of pattern with sort of irregular angles rather than a germinal center that's uh, breaking up or something like that. And then if you do the uh, Epstein-Barr virus testing, uh, you'd, you'd identify uh, the incorporated uh, uh, antigens and so forth with that. Now, I'm not sure every lab has uh, EBV incorporated into their uh, in situ hybridization capabilities. Uh, depends a little bit on your uh, location. Uh, this tumor is actually fairly frequent in some ethnic groups, particularly the uh, uh, Inuit Indians or Inuit uh, Eskimos of the far northern Canada and Alaska. Uh, and so it's a uh, more common in those locations where it's almost universally Epstein-Barr associated, uh, but in other ethnic groups it can occur, uh, but has a little bit less of the uh, Epstein-Barr association in those groups. Here's uh, some immunohistochemistry, um, and I think you can guess uh, based on the pattern of staining you're seeing here that this is uh, uh, staining with a pancytokeratin because it's staining all of these epithelial components and not staining the uh, intervening lymphoid elements. 
And I think we have another stain here. Let's just verify which one this is. Uh, gee, they didn't tell us. So um, I think, again, this is a uh, an EMA or a, an epithelial marker. It looks like we're getting uh, nuclear staining. So this could be something like a P40 or P63 uh, stain. Uh, it would not be a, 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 a <clears throat> PAX-5 or something of that sort. So these probably are a very poorly differentiated or undifferentiated squamous carcinoma. So sometimes they will have a, those squamous markers. Okay, well, that was the only case I could find. So you'll have to uh, uh, take my word for it. That's why it's rare. We don't have a, a whole lot in our teaching files. So we talked early on about pleomorphic adenoma. And we know that that's a benign lesion. But if these lesions sit around for a long time, uh, aren't treated, um, you can develop pleomorphic adenoma with carcinoma coming from it. In order to make this diagnosis, you have to be able to see histologically uh, both the benign pleomorphic adenoma and a malignant component. Or in the case where there's a known prior resection of a benign pleomorphic adenoma in that area, and now you have a malignant component, you could probably surmise that this was carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. Now, as I mentioned, the longer one of these lesions is present, the more likelihood that you're going to develop a malignancy. And so usually we see this in older patients, uh, 60s, maybe 70s, even 80s. The most frequent cancers that we see are salivary duct carcinoma or just a nondescript adenocarcin adenocarcinoma but myoepithelial and epimyoepithelial carcinoma and sometimes squamous carcinomas and other carcinomas can occur in this setting. Um, because it can be present at various stages, uh, people have uh, sort of adopted the thyroid convention to uh, denote that there's an in situ element where you've got um, uh, clearly cytologically malignant uh, tissue within an encapsulated um, pleomorphic adenoma, which has still a few benign areas. Or you may have a very minimally invasive, just beginning to penetrate the capsule, or a more widely uh, variant. Um, those are kind of staging decisions uh, that may give you an idea of, uh, of, uh, of risk uh, being proportionate to the extent of uh, uh, stage or extension beyond the initial pleomorphic adenoma. So we have several examples of this. This is uh, fairly frequent because uh, pleomorphic adenoma is uh, frequent. Uh, and here we can see broad areas of necrosis, uh, an encapsulated uh, component. We'll take a look here at these edges here. Um, and I think you'll see and would agree that these look like kind of uh, benign uh, pleomorphic adenoma elements, uh, fairly low grade appearing. So then we'll go and look at other areas of this tumor and be able to identify uh, the uh, more aggressive invasive component. Um, and that may be like right here. So here we see a rather different cytology, uh, more aggressive looking, higher grade nuclei, associated necrosis, little spots of microinvasion here. Um, and so this is a, a nice example. Uh, notice that it still seems to be encapsulated. So you could say this is either minimally invasive, depending on what else you found in the other sections. Uh, or still, quote, in situ. Uh, I think it probably is invading here a little bit over in these areas uh, as we look here. Uh, but this is a nice example with both elements. And as you grow here, obviously, you may get the kind of ischemic uh, necrosis of other areas due to either pressure effects or other sorts of uh, changes with that. 
Uh, here's another example. And I don't know, I didn't pre-screen this one, so let's see what we've got here. So this looks like uh, the more conventional pleomorphic adenoma. Looks fairly bland and benign here. And then we come over here and we actually have, well, a little bit more maybe cystic change there. Beginnings of necrosis. And up here, I think you'll agree, higher grade malignant neoplasm, kind of solid, almost, uh, uh, almost squamoid, but uh, more ag aggressive looking uh, tumor in that location. So a little different morphology than the earlier case. And we have other features here. These can be quite complex because of the way they grow. Uh, here we can see, again, a little bit more uh, malignant appearing uh, tissue. Um, and uh, some, again, high grade uh, appearance. We'll go one more case here. Um, so this is uh, an immunohistochemical stain here showing the difference in uh, evaluation on that case. Uh, they didn't label the stain they did. Uh, so we could look at this and say, well, this looks like it may be, um, you know, a, a, uh, is this a myoepithelial marker? Yeah, so this may be a, a P63 or something like that that's staining these cells here, um, but not staining the uh, invasive component of the carcinomics pleomorphic adenomic quite the same way. Yeah, I'm not sure why I included that. Another example, uh, this is of a squamous cell carcinoma. We didn't have the uh, um, pleomorphic adenoma component identified on this, but I think this is probably coming out of a, a pleomorphic adenoma uh, because that's the most common point at which you find a squamous cell carcinoma, and you can see that that's what this is here. The patient was older, um, and obviously you've got uh, um, a nice invasive carcinoma developing here, uh, kind of growing in and around the uh, parotid tissue. Now you can get other tumors as well. You can get carcinosarcoma. Here's a non-keratinizing squamous carcinoma that can occur in this setting. Um, but you may not always be able to identify the uh, pleomorphic adenoma component. And there may not be a good history. So, you know, making the diagnosis of a squamous cell carcinoma uh, is okay, but you do want to think of the possibility that it arose from a pleomorphic adenoma. So sampling and uh, the history can be helpful uh, in that setting. And even uh, developing a so-called carcinosarcoma or sarcomatoid carcinoma uh, can occur here. Uh, this is, uh, I think, an example with some sort of almost heterologous elements of uh, bone developing here. Uh, at least certainly looks calcified. And uh, you can see the... Uh, Carcino carcinomatous element here, here. Um, so if nothing else, it may be a metaplastic tumor. Now this could arise also from uh, the secretory carcinoma that uh, sort of resembles breast carcinomas um, because that also could be the setting for a so-called metaplastic uh, carcinoma uh, with bone formation or heterologous elements. 
So it's always good to remember that uh, you can analogize with the, the breast uh, in many circumstances in this uh, situation. Take a look at this other area over here. So just a kind of a small cell or undifferentiated carcinoma type of uh, component here. So I'm not sure I would have called this carcinosarcoma because I haven't seen what I would consider a, a sarcomatoid uh, stromal component. We have the, uh, the bone formation. It's very uh, abnormal bone. It's not coming into focus very well here. Um, but I'm not seeing uh, amid this bone truly uh, uh, high-grade malignant uh, spindle cells uh, in this ele element. So I, it, may, it may be metaplastic or uh, reactive uh, bone in that setting. <clears throat> so we've mentioned the, uh, the mammary analog uh, analogy, and this is um, epitomized in what's now called secretory carcinoma, or previously most frequently known as mammary, mammary analog secretory carcinoma, or MASC. Um, and this is a tumor that very much looks like breast carcinoma. Um, it's most frequent in the parotid. And then in the sub minor salivary glands, uh, more frequently than either the submandibular or others. Now, in contrast to breast carcinomas, this is more frequent in men, um, but it does happen over a very wide age range uh, from children, pediatric age on through uh, advanced adulthood. Um, and interestingly, this is a tumor that has an NTREC uh, association with uh, ETB6. Um, and so in some circumstances, this may be um, amenable to targeted therapy for anti entrec agents. Uh, like breast cancers, it can have a variety of patterns, papillary, lobular, tubular, et cetera. Um, and these cells tend to have a sort of foamy cytoplasm with round nuclei and a very distinct nucleolus. They're positive with the markers that you might think of for breast cancer, GATA3, mammoglobin, so forth, CK7, but also can be positive with SOX10, S100, and so forth. Um, they generally have a fairly low grade behavior, but they will have a fairly high rate of lymph node metastases. So let's take a look at some examples. Uh, here's a large uh, sort of dilated duct type of appearance. Um, and here we see these cells with a, a very characteristic bubbly cytoplasm. You can see them here. Um, this, um, and you can see also here the round nuclei with uh, a little bit of maybe a nucleolus that doesn't show here very well. But that's the cytology. That's a very classic cytology. Um, and as you can see, it doesn't have here a high grade uh, appearance or a, uh, an aggressive invasive component. So uh, it can at some times be considered an in situ neoplasm uh, as well. Here's another example, sharply circumscribed. A uh, little bit different pattern, more solid and uh, microcystic pattern. Uh, but again, notice the quite bubbly, foamy cytoplasm, round nuclei, almost apocrine like in some ways. Um, and uh, if you imagine, there's a few nucleoli in these uh, areas as well. So, fairly nice uh, characteristic appearance. And I'd encourage you to come back and look at these uh, cases that you don't see very frequently so that you can kind of uh, get a feel for the patterns and examine them for yourself to see what it looks like. Now notice here, there's a little bit of an area of sort of a second uh, cell type in some of these. Uh, so that's a possibility as well, sort of a more 
um, uh, cuboidal or, or uh, columnar type of cell. Here's another example. Uh, again, a different uh, pattern of uh, growth. See sort of a trabecular growth with a lot of uh, intervening fluid and some exfoliated cells sort of looks like a almost like a you know a, a alveolar pattern or a um, renal cell pattern with uh, uh, papillary cystic uh, changes. So I think this pattern is distinctive enough that uh, if you see a few cases of this, uh, you'll recognize it immediately when uh, you see uh, the next case in your institution. It's not terribly common. Uh, here's a very small lesion. And again, sort of a, a foamy or microcystic pattern. Uh, to these cells, low to intermediate grade nuclei with uh, some clearing and central nucleoli. Oh, that's my carcinosarcoma case again. We'll skip that. Okay, another tumor, uh, again, which has a fairly broad age range is a cynic cell carcinoma. Um, and this is defined as a, a tumor that has some level of serous acinar differentiation. In other words, it has cytoplasmic zymogen and granules. Um, it's more frequently seen in the parotid than the other glands, uh, but again, it has a wide age range from pediatrics to adults. Um, more frequent in Caucasian um, and a variety of patterns. Uh, this tumor has an extraordinarily good survival, however, um, and so that's very encouraging. Um, I'll just point out this tumor can be positive for DOG1. Um, and we usually use PASD to demonstrate the zymogen granules. So the PAS stain should light up those uh, granules quite nicely. Okay, so here's a couple of examples and we can think of how this is similar to what we've looked at before. So here's a lymphoid pattern here, a lymph node, uh, an intraparotid uh, lymph node that has a metastatic uh, tumor. So we've indicated that it metastasizes to tumors, to lymph nodes frequently, but yet has a, a good prognosis. So let's see if we can identify the uh, zymogen uh, differentiation in the cytoplasm here. So most often these uh, tumors have a somewhat um, nested or acinar or, or acinous type of pattern, uh, small nests, maybe a little bit of a ductal type pattern. Uh, but someplace in the tumor, we should probably see cells with this slightly bluish cytoplasm like these here that appears granular. And you would go to high magnification and see those granules uh, in, in some of these cells. Not all of them will have them, but some of them should have that, uh, that feature. Um, and then if you do the PAS stain, uh, you should be able to demonstrate uh, that uh, that has those are positive uh, with the PAS. Now, obviously, if you have dog one and so forth, that may be helpful as well. Sometimes the granules are almost macro size. And you can see here, there's quite a few sort of macro type granules. So these may also be uh, zymogen granules and these cells here. Uh, so sometimes it can be fairly easy to identify. Okay, here's an immunohistochemical stain. I believe this, well, it didn't tell us the stain here. I believe this is a dog one. So you can see positivity, a little bit of uh, uh, apical staining on the, on the uh, cells uh, here with this uh, marker. 
Here's another example, um, a little bit different pattern here. So let's take a look and see what this is going to teach us. So again, this looks like an interparotid lymph node that has that contains a metastatic deposit. But here, I think you can see even at this magnification, there's a lot of uh, blue granularity here, uh, bluish purple. Now, so if you have a cytology smear, that will show them even better because uh, these will uh, be quite characteristic on a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, right game sustain if you're doing cytology. But uh, this is a diagnostic of those uh, acinar type uh, cells in this lesion here. So uh, you'd have very little difficulty uh, finding that feature here. Uh, but notice this sort of sieve-like pattern, lots of open cystic spaces uh, in the node, but a more uh, solid appearance over here. Well, you have a very lymphoid stroma over here too. So this may be uh, entirely in a lymph node here in the parotid. So again, you can see the very purplish uh, pattern to the zymogen granules uh, that make this di diagnosis quite quite fun to make and quite unique uh, relative to other tumor types. But as you've seen, it can be very readily apparent or it can be much more subtle in just a few cells. So you have to be on the alert for it in a variety of settings and uh, use your stain if need be. Now, um, I've got a couple of cases of uh, small cell carcinoma, which I wanted to present, which is a very uh, unusual, I mean, it's not a very common tumor to have small cell carcinoma, but it, it presents with a very interesting differential um, relative to uh, uh, location and so forth. So there are rare small cell carcinomas that occur uh, in the parotid or in other salivary glands, and they typically have neuroendocrine features and so forth. Uh, but met metastasis to the parotid or parotid lymph nodes is probably equally common from either respiratory or other small cell neoplasms. Um, and that's particularly true when we start to talk about Merkel cell carcinoma, which I wanted to show this in contrast to uh, Merkel cell, which we will look at in just a minute. So you see nice nuclear molding, you see scant cytoplasm, no, uh, you know, sort of uh, salt and peppery chromatin or sort of diffuse pattern there. This looks like a small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma um, and uh, that's indeed what it is. Um, somehow it got mixed in with myosinic cell carcinomas and I'm just gonna skip over this one. Um, another acinic cell carcinoma, notice this has these large ducts, and uh, here's the acinic carcinoma, which is obviously quite, um, got quite a bit of uh, basal or, uh, or assume zymogen type uh, differentiation in it. Now you could ask, well, isn't this just a dilated duct? But I think you can see here's more normal, and this is, um, quite uh, different appearing uh, tissue. Even though you have a little bit of ductular uh, structure in here, I don't think this is normal parotid that's been displaced. But that might be in the differential. You could have a cystically dilated lesion um, and just have a few uh, zymogen positive uh, cells in this lesion, which I think you'll see here. Well, that's not the best differentiation of it. So I'm not sure I'm buying this one. I'd need more sections on that to get to that diagnosis. So we're gonna go forward from this. Here's one here, again, associated with a little bit of lymphoid inflammation um, and not in a typical uh, lobular pattern of the uh, normal acinus. Uh, there you can see it. I think this is with the PAS stain, 
which will highlight for you how easy this is to light up the zymogen granules. So you can see here all of this magenta colored material. That's your positive PAS reaction with uh, acinar cells uh, that is diagnostic for acinic cell carcinoma. One more example. Here's a large cystic space. This may be another section on that earlier case that I showed you. Um, and here we see the pattern, a very sort of microcystic pattern. Not a lot of zymogen type appearing granularity here. So this would be one where I would definitely do the PAS stain and my other stains to sort of verify that this was uh, acinar cell carcinoma <clears throat> because it's not uh, clear, clearly uh, that sort of a lesion. So very different pattern with this uh, glandular dilatation and a microcystic pattern uh, that could be a number of other things as well. Um, and your stains would be useful to nail that down in this case. Another example, I've got a lot of these, don't I? Here you can see more solid growth pattern and clearly got very granular cytoplasm, round nuclei, that pattern that we uh, be much more classic for acinar cell carcinoma. But notice here how it does have an infiltrative pattern in areas. So solid, infiltrative, um, a little lace-like, and here you can see a little bit more of this uh, almost microcystic pattern like we had in that uh, earlier case, and a little bit of lymphoid stroma like maybe it's in a lymph node. So uh, other features that we associate with this. Well, I'm gonna skip this case and let you come back to that. Um, here again is another immunohistochemical stain. Let's see if we labeled this one. No. 40 year old male. And again, this is staining our brush border here. So this is our uh, dog one stain. And we'll skip this one too. All right, so I said I was gonna talk about Merkel cell carcinoma. And we're just about out of time, so I want to get to this. So Merkel cell carcinoma is not usually considered a primary tumor in the parotid, but it oftentimes does present as a parotid mass. Um, and that may be the only evidence of the tumor, perhaps because the cutaneous site is too small or has regressed. But this is a tumor that can look like small cell carcinoma, um, but has a different um, uh, immunophenotype and a different, in some ways, and uh, certainly a different uh, pathogenesis and probably has a very different uh, therapy. So it's important to make the distinction of Merkel cell carcinoma from small cell carcinoma. Uh, it's a sun exposure issue, but it also has a very strong association with polyoma virus. Um, if you see, if you stain it with CK20, you should see a very characteristic dot-like pattern that is very strongly suggestive of Merkel cell carcinoma. It will stain with some neuroendocrine markers like synaptophysin, CD56, chromogranin, and so forth, but it is not, um, it's not the same disease as small cell carcinoma. So it's important to add the CK20 and do the polyoma virus test uh, stain if you have it available. Um, and that's because, you know, chemotherapy will be used for small cell carcinoma, but it doesn't work. It doesn't have any role in uh, um, Merkel cell carcinoma. Immunotherapy may have, a, a, have value. Uh, and so this is a different, uh, different beast. So here's uh, an example, uh, and we can compare it to that small cell carcinoma we just looked at and uh, got another one, I think, later. Um, but you can see... These are 
neuroendocrine looking cells. They're molding each other. They have very scant cytoplasm. They have very finely stippled chromatin. Um, and there's areas of necrosis. I mean, it looks a lot like small cell carcinoma. Uh, here's a nerve that's involved. Um, but the, the defining characteristic is uh, immunohistochemistry that's positive for the uh, Merkel cell polyoma virus. Uh, uh, and this is the antibody that's been used, uh, CM2B4. Uh, it's a nuclear stain for this uh, polyoma virus. Um, but it's, uh, it's not uh, essential, I think, if you have the, uh, the dot-like positivity, that's quite unusual in a small cell carcinoma. Here's small cell carcinoma, just to compare again. Uh, and you can see you know, how, how very similar these uh, two diseases uh, look under the microscope and at high power. So um, just remember that differential. Uh, with small cell carcinoma, you have to be concerned about metastasis from other sites, nasopharynx, uh, lung, and so forth. With Merkel cell, you want to be thinking about metastasis from other skin sites on the head and neck region, UV exposed uh, sites. Now there's also a, uh, I'll skip that small cell carcinoma case. There's also a large cell neuroendocrine uh, tumor that has been reported in the uh, uh, salivary glands. Uh, this was uh, submitted as such a case. Um, you can see there's maybe a little bit more cytoplasm. It's not a very good scan. Um, and I think this, the section may have been frozen or something. Um, so there's a little bit more cytoplasm. Um, in general, for large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas, you should have neuroendocrine-like nuclei with uh, finely stippled chromatin. And generally, it's not defined by uh, exclusively by neuroendocrine markers, but they should be present if you've got the nuclear features of that disorder. Finally, let's talk about the maltoma, extranodal marginal zone lymphoma. lymphoma. Uh, this it can occur in many sites, but salivary gland is one where it can be missed or mistaken for other things. Uh, and that's because we get uh, these lymphocytic uh, inflammatory processes. We've got lymphoepithelial carcinoma and so forth um, that can be seen here. Uh, this is a monocytoid uh, type cell that uh, often surrounds these epi and myoepithelial islands. Um, and it has positive B-cell markers as well as BCL2. Uh, but it's negative for germinal center markers like CD10. It's negative for cyclin D1. It's not um, uh, mantle cell lymphoma um, and uh, so forth. So here's uh, an example. Uh, we have a lymphoid stroma here. And you can see these epimyoepithelial nests here. Um, and, uh, you know, you can be wondering, well, is this the cancer or whatever? But notice these cells surrounding here are um, rather monotypic. They're sort of monocytoid, roundish, small, medium-sized. These are the malignant cell here rather than the epimyoepithelial cells. So the differential for this can oftentimes be that lymphoepithelial carcinoma uh, that I showed you earlier. Uh, where you know you might take a photo of this and and be you know convinced it's it's that. So this is where um, you know doing your your markers uh, will be helpful, um, and if possible, uh, being able to demonstrate clonality either using flow cytometry, which is probably preferred, or using um, uh, in situ hybridization for kappa and lambda and other uh, the other B markers that we've we've talked about. Okay, so I think that's pretty much where I wanted to, to close. Uh, you can get metastatic tumors here that can look like primary tumors. Renal cell carcinoma is uh, one example here you can see, uh, you know, nested clear cells, a little foamy. You might wonder about, you know, the uh, uh, mammary secretory carcinoma uh, like lesion with these type of cells. Um, and then there's a number of other sorts of things to, to be aware of.
uh, but we've uh, we've talked about some of these earlier, and uh, we won't take time for them tonight. So, um, whoops, there's breast tumors. If you're ready for 90% of salivary tumors. Um, let's uh, see if there's uh, any questions. I think I see some comments here, so let me uh, turn to those and begin to uh, to answer the questions that have been uh, raised. So. Um, if you have large sheet type pattern in, a, in the whole slide, what characteristics would suggest adenoid cystic carcinoma? So that's a very good question. Um, I think the low grade nuclei uh, would raise that concern. Uh, you could think about polymorphous low grade carcinoma being in the differential. And we showed you some immunohistochemistries that are different for those two uh, tumors. Um, those are things that, uh, that I would say would be the, the things. Um, <clears throat> and next question, why is P63 expressed in uh, polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma while P40 is not? So uh, P63 is an interesting marker. As you know, it is uh, often positive in squamous elements, um, as is P40. But P63 is also uh, characteristically a myoepithelial marker. And so uh, we use it uh, in breast tumors for myoepithelial cells, for example. Um, and so I think it's the myoepithelial component that's being seen in polymorphous low-grade carcinoma. Whereas P40 does not mark myoepithelial cells, it tends to mark the, the squamoid uh, differentiating cells. Okay, Mary says, uh, next session, I'd be interested in the molar pregnancy case. You saw the case that I published or posted on that uh, and papillary lesions of the breast. So that would, uh, that would be a good uh, suggestion. I will take that in mind, appreciate that. Um, lymphoepithelial carcinoma looks like nasopharyngeal carcinoma in a metastatic situation. And that's exactly right. That is uh, an important differential. And so before you would make the diagnosis of uh, lymphoepithelial carcinoma primary in the salivary gland, you should make very certain that there's no evidence of a nasopharyngeal uh, or upper airway mass because these are very, very similar um, and could be easily mistaken. That's a great question, uh, Dr. Lin. Um, so uh, how do it differentiate primary small cell carcinoma from the, of the salivary gland versus metastatic tumor? Uh, the only way I think in that situation to distinguish them would be uh, clinical staging and clinical factors. There's not any immunohistochemistry that would be specific for a primary um, tumor of the salivary gland, primary small cell carcinoma of the salivary gland. Just like, you know, we have other small cell carcinomas that look a lot like, you know, express lung markers or other, you know, GI markers, et cetera. Uh, it's not uh, immunohistochemically possible at this point to define primary site for those tumors. Uh, Dr. Duan asks, is there a benign tumor of the acinar cells in the salivary gland? That's a good question. Um, I don't think I've seen benign acinar tumors. I suppose, you know, you could get some sort of hyperplasia, but usually the acinar differentiation that you'll see uh, is going to be orderly. And, and so um, I don't think there's a, a true acinar adenoma. Uh, in the in the salivary gland. Great question. Okay, well, it's uh, probably time for you to get on to work the rest of your day. Um, I thank you for these great questions and for paying attention. And if you have other suggestions for topics you'd like to see us cover uh, for next time, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, text me or send me an email and uh, we will try to work something out that will be enjoyable um, for, for this. It's been great to be with you, and uh, thanks for listening.
All right. We'll see you again soon. Yeah. And I'll send Thank you the you so link. much, Professor. Uh, goodbye. Yeah. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you.